Okay, Pre uh, recording. Okay, I ask this uh, lovely question. My my poor ego is taking all the blame, and um, you know, for me, um, this uh, this qu question, my ego is taking all the blame, is um, for me uh, in the context of you know the, the ego taking a battering through doing spiritual work and it becomes the thing that um because the ego is taking such a battering you know feeling that all the spiritual work is about dissolving the ego and that the poor ego and there's lots of uh there's lots i've heard lots of stuff like i need an, i need i need my ego it's functional uh you can't blame my ego because uh it helps me to survive i'd be dead without my ego <laughs> I'd be dead without my ego. That does sound funny. Um, so, you know, it, it's helped me. You know, all my addictions, you know, all, all the addictions I've picked, it was just, uh, my ego was just trying to help me and just try and cope with the life and get me through. And if it wasn't for my ego, um, you know, I'd be dead. So I really, I really like my ego. Uh, I think, you know, and students may think certain spiritual pathways like, uh, of course, in miracles, there are other very advanced pathways uh, that seek for um, the end of the ego and, and rebirth to that which is beyond the ego is a bit extreme. You know, it's a bit you're going a bit OTT there. You know, I mean, probably you want a healthy balance and it's not all about my ego. It's it's their egos as well. You know, you can't just blame my ego. It's, it's, it's also their egos that's at fault, you know. So let's have a balanced view. So all of these things and and students may get dismayed uh, with teachers that seem to uh, want to uh, eradicate uh, the ego or get a, a deep, deep fear or think this is really OTT or over the top. So uh, I would say to that, I mean, this is my view. In truth, um, the ego is the block. Um, uh, let, let's paraphrase Buddha. You know, I, I cannot... Um, escape the effects of old age suffering and death until all my attachments are released and that that is a quote for enlightenment you know how can i forevermore never suffer um never suffer you know old age that's pretty good isn't it good promise uh who wants never to suffer the experience of old age um poverty and uh, um, all attachments to this world need to be released and then there's total freedom and even freedom from reincarnation and the story going on and on uh, seemingly forever the the uh, so the story of duality a me in relationship to a world out there um so i actually like the 12 you know i would paraphrase i'm going to talk about the 12 steps because uh, i'm in the 12 step groups i mean they say that uh, with addiction, if you haven't got a connection to power, i.e., to the to grace, to the infinite, to 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 that which is beyond this world, <clears throat> which is not of this world but seems to be here as well, accessible, then uh, life becomes unmanageable. So, I mean, the extreme states of ego are usually addiction, where the ego becomes so uh, enslaved and bondage to certain things in the world which it cherishes and thinks are the source of life. Um, so uh, myself, I'll talk about myself. I mean, food addiction was my first addiction where the feeling, let's say from The Course in Miracles, I mean, like, that you could say that, you know, the feeling of fear and fear and separation, or, or you could say uh, guilt and separation or shame and separation or anger and separation, um, that experience of being a limited self, experiencing emotions and and thoughts, uh, uh, attack thoughts or all kinds of thoughts, negative thoughts, basically on a, on a higher level, limiting thoughts, because all thoughts that are identified create a sense of limitation in consciousness. So all of those things are actually a block to that, shall we say, the infinite presence, uh, to um, the of Course in Miracles would call it the holy instant. The, the instant where there is holiness or the instant where there is no separation 
and one is not hooked into fear, guilt, shame, or a, a, a me in separation to others, where all of that is dissolved uh, and is also beyond time and form. So uh, classically called enlightenment, uh, you know, holy means there is not two. When the holy instance is here, in terms of the Course in Miracles, there cannot be a me and you, it no longer exists, a me in relationship to you, that, that has gone, and it's beyond time as well. So, um, so, oh yes, so the ego, so 12 steps, I think I got it, you know, the more, what we realize in the 12 steps, the more the ego has got um, attachments, i.e. addictions, and aversions, i.e. fears and guilt and shame uh, around things, the more one's life becomes unmanageable. It's actually anti-life. So um, the, the, more, um, the more inflated the ego is, the more, um, <clears throat> the more inflated the ego is, the more um, uh, it seems to the, to the separate self, to the, to the ego self, to the personal identity, that life becomes more, unma more unmanageable and more horrific. <clears throat> because, you know, as the uh, life and death alcoholics, myself included, as a life and death food and work workaholic, um, you know, as the organs start to fail in the body, uh, and doctors are trying to save the life of the um, body uh, and the ego that's in distress. So that, so the ego, and uh, and you know the the teachers, the high teachers that teach are releasing the ego. I mean the um, the very high teachers, I'd say, do not say uh, keep a little bit of your ego because it's good to have a balance between your ego and the infinite. Um, some teachers might, but um, I'm not in that category. So it seemed to be a direct correlation. Uh, Dr. David R. Hawkins talks about, uh, quite a lot about this, but it's actually a direct, the more there is repressed fear, shame, and guilt under the hood, the more that one is <clears throat> addicted to the world or makes anything in the world special in terms of the Course in Miracles be special. Um, I, um, identifying cakes as special, identifying one's own body as special, one's own thoughts as being special. Um, when, when, when my body, my thoughts, or oh, other bodies and other thoughts are seen as special rather than meaningless, then one has a tendency to hook in. Also this thing of um, uh, what I call enslavement to the ego and the world, which obscures freedom, because if one cherishes or allows one's own individual seemingly, well, in truth, there is no individual, but if seemingly one is um, identified with one's thoughts, um, one will start to feel less and less happy consistently. I mean, the ego is very clever in that it creates ups and downs from experience. So the ego says, I like this person, I don't like that person. I like this thought, I don't like that thought. I like chocolate cakes, but I don't like spinach. So. So life becomes, uh, um, but, you know, attractions and aversions, which is like, well, I want I more ice cream and less spinach. I like that person more, but less this. So, and then, you know, if uh, if a certain person is seen, there's fear or guilt. And if another person is seen, there's... So this kind of thing creates enslavement or bondage to the world. Now, the thing that's actually happening there is um, as one gets cut off from... You know, it can be called grace, um, enlightenment, the holy instant, the eternal now, that which is beyond all form uh, and, and beyond uh, the seeming separation in this world. Um, one starts as one release more, releases, and this has been my experience, release more and more of the ego, the states of sublime peace, uh, stillness, um, unity, the disappearance of my ego self and things seeming to uh, mystically unfold. And I use the languaging, like the, the world seems to be witnessed unfolding as perfect as it is, where everything is seen in beauty and everything's exquisitely what it is. So these states are actually, um, uh, it's seen that <clears throat> as you do spiritual work, they become more and more dominant and more and more frequent 
and the the pull or as someone said the hooks into keep hooking back into fear to guilt keep hooking back into my personal story keep hooking into stories of others uh, starts to get less and less frequent so in some spiritual work you could call it transcending the world transcending the world is that uh, uh, by transcending the world there is nothing left in this world which can pull you out of out of the infinite there is no there is no seeming individual thought that is so important that there is a hook in there or identification with that the body is no longer seen the seeming personal body is no longer <clears throat> at all important identified hooked in others are not seen to be or a witness to be uh, no one is seen to be special. In fact, you could say from one's private history, everything is seen to be meaningless. And this then invites uh, grace, the holy instant, the eternal now, um, uh, pure awareness, um, which is beyond duality, separation, this, that, where there's, no, there's nothing left in the world that, is temp that tempts one into identification or hooks. So that freedom becomes uh, <clears throat> ever present. So to get there, uh, I would say quite a few teachers, the teachers of enlightenment say then, um, you know, the ego, the ego has to completely go. So nothing, there's nothing left in the personal ego that would create separation or limitation uh, forevermore. That's classically called enlightenment. And, um, um, you know, Ramana Maharishi, he talked about the death of his ego, where he watched, you know, the terror of death. Um, my teacher, Dr. David R. Hawkins, talks about ego death and going through the terror of the ego finally dying and being, and the birth to that which is eternal and never falls from grace. Uh, and also, um, so yes, um, and also myself, uh, which I didn't go through, but I do remember uh, watching a DVD about a teacher saying, you know, going for the jugular on just totally dissolving the ego forevermore and an extreme terror arising that if you go, and it was known, if you go through this last terror, the screaming, the dying, of, it doesn't sound very nice, does it? <laughs> that doesn't sound nice, but the dying, you know, don't go through this terror because that will actually dissolve forevermore for all eternity, uh, the personal ego. So um, in terms of students, um, you know, I'd have to talk to each student as to why they want to um, um, hold on to their ego or why they think it's not. I mean, yes, there, there is actually a good point in the question. You can't, you can't like attack your ego. So, or blame, it's not about attacking or blaming an ego or, or saving an ego. <clears throat> it's about releasing it. So it's true that if you try and attack your ego, there's, you create a duality. There's a me, uh, <clears throat> you've created another me that's trying to kill an ego. And so it seems to create almost like two personalities of an aspect of self, separate self, trying to get rid of another self. So that's not useful. So um, when you um, forgive the ego and or I like the course lesson make the thoughts meaningless make the body meaningless um, make the ego meaningless if the ego is made meaningless forever then um, then uh, you know it is um, uh, it, it can't really you know it can't really fight if everything the ego says or anything the world comes up is meaningless there is no me trying to get rid of the ego. So it, it avoids that um, potential trap of demonizing the ego. It's almost like letting go. I'm not going to hook into the thoughts that come up, uh, the body, or I'm not going to hook into, there's going to be no hook or identification to how others respond or think. Oh, the feelings, you know, whether this feeling, I'm not going to give any story or identification or meaning to any feelings that seem to come and go. So uh, that's the thing. So that for me is, yeah, avoid the trap of demonizing or trying to attack the ego. It's more like um, certain things like meaninglessness or forgiving the ego. If the ego was 100% forgiven, everything within it was forgiven, it would disappear forever because it's like, um, it's like, uh, 
absolute radical forgiveness means that there's nothing left to forgive. When there's nothing left to forgive, <clears throat> anything that is completely surrendered or forgiven or accepted dissolves into nothingness. You know, it becomes a thing. Like everyone's experienced this in their life where something seemed to be so important or so painful or so enjoyable. And then at a certain point, it's released completely. And, and then it's like one never has a thought about it. It's like completely gone. Um, and this would uh, this definitely happens in 12 step groups. Um, each group, when they there is the full release, meaninglessness and surrender of an addiction, for example, alcohol, it'll be like even if one sees alcohol, it's meaningless. Even if one is offered alcohol, it's meaningless. I mean, there's, there's nothing left in there. It no longer has its charge or its hook or its allure. And that's very easily describable because when the inner state of, shall we say, grace, bliss, awareness is so profound, one is beyond time, uh, beyond space, beyond body, beyond thoughts, beyond this world, beyond identifying or hooking into anything that is of, that is of the world of limitation and that is transitory and passing, then um, uh, it is experienced uh, that the, you know, the, the power and, or we could say the bliss or the eternal stillness <clears throat> that that overrides. I mean, it's very, very easy to see that, no, I mean, if someone was to say, like, have a donut, you'll feel better, um, have a chocolate cake, you'll feel better, or like, uh, you know, there's sex on offer, you'll feel better. I mean, it's ridiculous, because that sublime experience um, is beyond any temptation in this world. It also silences the thoughts, uh, it's beyond uh, negativity. So, um, so, but you know, for each student, it's up to them if they want to keep aspects of their ego. Um, I do think each aspect of the ego that's kept uh, creates um, it. It has a price. If one wants to have personal thoughts, then there will always be a me in separation to others. If one thinks that anger is useful, like, oh, no, no, I can't let go of my anger completely, my anger at myself and others, because I need that to survive and that's going a bit extreme. Well, you know, you know, one can live with anger. Uh, but my experience has been actually, <clears throat> uh, yes, there's a Course in Miracles lessons. I'm sustained by the love of God. I think I'll use the Course in Miracles and the 12 steps. So the Course in Miracles says I'm sustained by the love. Of, it doesn't say I'm sustained by the love of donuts. Uh, it doesn't say I'm sustained by my special love for others. It doesn't say I'm sustained by money. It says I'm sustained. And that I can share from my experience is true. It's like the closer and closer I get into the field of grace, I, I call it the continuous miraculous. Miracle after miracle is witnessed to, to happen throughout the day. And it's almost like a grace gives one, gives one or the aware, pure awareness or, or the, the holy instant gives immunity from suffering. Or, uh, but as soon as anything gets identified, as soon as there's a hook into fear, guilt, personal thoughts, others being wrong or life being wrong or the world being wrong, then suddenly it seems one is, you know, for myself, it would be like I'm cast, oh my God, Charles says we call it unmanageability, or it's now like my ego is trying to be the source of my survival and happiness, and it's never more enjoyable than when it's not around. Um, okay, I shall stop, uh, press the stop button.